Research and evaluation is crucial for the future of cultural diplomacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in expressing our sincere welcome and thanks to Ms. Deborah Bull. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all and thank you very much for inviting me along today to talk about cultural diplomacy and my belief that it's time now to turn the spotlight of robust research and evaluation on this subject for which so many claims are so often made. It's a very timely moment to be having this conversation. Over recent months, there have been more publications and enough round tables, conferences, and summits to keep all of our diaries busy and full. Last week, Soft Power uh, was in the news again when a new Soft Power Index from Portland Communications put Britain in the top spot ahead of 29 other nations. But nevertheless, I suspect there are as many interpretations of cultural diplomacy as there are people in this room. So I'm going to preface my remarks today by clarifying what I mean by cultural diplomacy. Borrowing somewhat from Joseph Nye, I use the term to refer to a set of policies and practices that attempt to use culture in order to influence the attitudes and the behaviors of others. To what end? Well. That depends on the particular circumstances. But for me, the key point is the acknowledgement that culture is a mechanism by which change can be made to occur. And before I go any further, I should say that when I say culture, I'm particularly referring to arts and cultural activities like music, art, theater, film, dance, and so on, rather than broader cultural expressions like language or cuisine. But despite all these events and despite all the discourse, my contention is that cultural diplomacy remains poorly articulated, poorly understood, and at the moment it's largely immune from academic scrutiny and analysis. And of course, this places cultural diplomacy in a curious position. In contrast, there's an ever-increasing amount of research into the impact and value of a wide range of arts and cultural activities in a variety of other areas health and well-being, and educational attainment come to mind. But given the enormous claims that are made for the role of culture in diplomacy, how is it that this particular contribution of the cultural sector has remained out of the view of the critical eye of academic study? So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to set out some of the ways in which academic research has helped to uncover the value of culture to people, to places, to economies, and to nations. And I'm also going to unpick some of the characteristics that make cultural diplomacy a distinct strand of policy, and thereby present a fresh set of challenges to researchers in this field. And along the way, I want to emphasize the benefits that derive from an evidence-led approach to cultural policy. And I'll finish by outlining my ambitions to bring a degree of academic rigor and analysis to the field of cultural diplomacy. But let me start by focusing on the imperative to develop evidence-led policy in this area. Cultural policy is, in most of the developed world is increasingly subject to management approaches developed, to management approaches developed in business, the private sector, and other areas of public policy. What does this mean? Well, in short, that cultural policies nowadays are designed, in theory at least, to achieve the greatest possible impact and generate the most pos positive outcomes. The question is no longer, what did we do? Nowadays, the question is always, what difference did we make? And policymakers, practitioners, and advocates in the cultural sector have taken a while to respond to this agenda, resisting what's sometimes felt to be an overemphasis on instrumentalism. My view as an artist and as a, somebody at the interface between academia and the sector, my view is slightly different. For me, the real purpose of the arts and culture is to make a difference to challenge our preconceptions, to educate our emotions, to enrich and expand the concepts on which we can draw as we attempt to understand ourselves and to understand the world around us. The challenge of evidencing the impact of arts and culture to meet this imperative can only be adequately met by high quality academic research. And a growing body of research is showing the benefits of arts and culture to individuals, to communities, and to society. 
Just over a year ago at King's College London, we launched a new web portal called culturecase.org. And the aim of this site was simple. It collates academic research from around the world into the, into the impact of arts and culture, and it shares it in a clear and accessible way outside the university's walls. So it's not speaking academic to academic, it's speaking academic to the cultural sector. There are over 100 summaries of, of academic research on Culture Case, and they demonstrate, among many other things, the therapeutic benefits of singing, the potential of arts and culture to increase the attractiveness of residential neighborhoods, and the ways that arts and culture can uniquely bring together diverse communities. None of the research, by the way, there is no research that evidences the impact of culture within cultural diplomacy, but we'll come back to that. Earlier this year, I went to Davos to the World Economic Forum to speak about some of the evidence we'd found in front of global leaders from the worlds of politics, business, and civic society. And after one of these talks, I was asked directly whether there was equivalent evidence for the use of culture in the service of soft power. Having trawled the journals in order to build cult culture case, I could say quite unequivocally that there is not. Those people working in arts education or town planning or in the area of arts and health can all draw upon robust evidence to make their case and to make effective choices about how scarce resources are allocated. There simply isn't the same kind of evidence available to people working in the field of cultural diplomacy. So why not? One possible explanation is that many areas of cultural policy are increasingly tied to decision-making that espouses the primacy of outcomes and impacts, for instance, tourism, infrastructure, exports, talent development, and so on. But the same is just not true for cultural diplomacy. The reason for this is that cultural dip diplomacy is a diffuse and multifaceted area of cultural policy. Its main agents, and perhaps those who decide upon its objectives, frequently sit apart from the policymakers in conventional policymaking agencies. And it's also true that cultural diplomacy has something of a shadowy reputation. It's most effective when government involvement is at a distance, out of earshot. None of us wants to feel that our feelings are being manipulated or influenced, and we certainly don't want to think that governments are trying to manipulate the way we feel. So cultural diplomacy is, if you like, the ninja of the cultural policy world. It operates by stealth. And this presents a challenge to those of us who want to study its processes, its agents, and its effects. Last year, Christopher Hill and Susan Beadle wrote a report for the British Academy on the topic of soft power, and they urged caution for scholars seeking to, de to, seeking to measure, understand, or account for soft power, and also they urged caution for governments seeking to deploy it. They argued that when governments conspicuously use soft power, for instance in national branding campaigns or overseas outposts, it frequently backfires. Soft power may well be left best to develop on its own. And the report concludes that soft power raises real problems of agency because it primarily de denotes structural advantages which help over the long term but are not easy to translate into policy. And of course, none of this is particularly new. Back in 2012, the Ditchley Foundation hosted a major summit on cultural diplomacy. Some of you may well have been there. But after bringing together the great and the good, the main conclusion was an identified need for more research into what works. So much for what we don't know. What can we say more concretely? The research that does exist points to cultural diplomacy as a dominant and more explicit form of cultural policy in East Asia, China, Japan, South Korea in particular spring to mind. Unsurprisingly, last month's special issue of the International Journal of Cultural Policy focuses on the Asia-Pacific region. Despite the promising approach, the papers that are in the uh, edition mainly struggle to move beyond describing what's going on. And the editorial to the special issue points out there's often a distinct lack of clarity in the way the notion of cultural diplomacy is used, on exactly what its practice involves, on why it's important, or on how it works. 
And, of course, it concludes that there is a need for a rigorous, theoretically informed analysis which locates cultural diplomacy practices within their social, political, and ideological contexts. The special edition is a welcome contribution to the debate, but it only scratches the surface. And back in the UK two years ago, the House of Lords convened an ad hoc committee to look at how the UK was deploying soft power. It took evidence from academics, politicians, and chief executives of civic and business organizations. They found the UK has numerous soft power assets and that by many people it's seen as a world leader in the use of soft power. Culture and creative industries were singled out as a particular area of strength. But they also found that government soft power policy was uncoordinated, underfunded, and unarticulated, and that some specific policies, such as funding cuts, for which we know there are more coming up, are damaging the UK's capability to use soft power to its fullest potential. The institutions most commonly cited as tools of soft power are the British Council, the BBC, and of course the Great Campaign, which some of you will have seen, is one of the UK's efforts to sell the country to overseas investors, tourists and students. Many passionate and persuasive claims are made for the power and the influence of these institutions and these initiatives, but to what extent can we objectively account, if, account for their impact? Like everyone, I subscribe to the chain of logic that suggests it's wise for the UK to invest in them, and that by generating familiarity and affinity with the UK will produce a warm feeling which persuades people to invest in us, to visit us, to educate their children here. It will lead to better international relationships. But how do we know how that's best achieved? What are the ingredients of effective cultural diplomacy? The truth is that we're short on data by which to appraise their relative impacts. There is a rare example of empirical research into this phenomenon done by a colleague of mine at King's College London, Dr Nisbet. She looked at the way that major museums in the UK exploited the foreign policy ambitions of the UK government back in the late 2000s in a way to siphon money to support a scheme that was their concocting, the World Collections Programme. In interviews with politicians, civil servants, and museum uh, professionals, she comes to the conclusion that, in fact, the government became a tool of the cultural inst institutions. It was not the cultural institutions that were a tool of the government. And we need more research like this, research that generates empirical data through which we can better understand this murky area of cultural policy. I'm sure if you look at your diaries, you'll find there's another invitation coming up. It may well be to a round table discussing the importance of the creative industries to the UK's image abroad. I think we'll keep on discussing these issues, but I think it's time we cut through the circle of round tables and bring some rigor and research to the discourse. So last month, I visited Geneva to continue the conversation that began in Davos and to meet diplomats and their officers at the United Nations offices. The UN there, as I'm sure you know, has a program of cultural activity, and the program is used by a large number of missions as a route to express their cultural ambitions, but also to assert their attractiveness to other missions in international Geneva. In conversations, different ambassadors had different levels of clarity about why they undertook these cultural activities. Most described arts and culture as a good in their own right. And while some resisted the suggestion that there might be another reason, or there must be another reason, to invest real money in these activities, some were very clear on their ulterior, or perhaps their actual motives. These ranged from the demonstration of status, a desire to make people feel good about their country, to the value of creating a different kind of social environment which could build stronger relationships between different ambassadors and their officers. One ambassador talked about the ways in which topics of great political sensitivity could be discussed in different ways through cultural activities. And he gave the example of a music performance that allowed him to speak from the heart and not the head about the challenges of immigration in his introductory remarks. He said that he could say things that he would not have been able to say on the floor at the United Nations in a, a concert in an arts environment. But over and over again, the same truth was evident. 
People expressed an intuitive feeling that there was something good about cultural activities, but they admitted that the chain of causality had never been articulated, questioned, or explored. And one thing was very clear. As a forum for, of diplomacy, it offers an incredible laboratory for investigation. And so we're talking to colleagues about a potential research project that would use this laboratory, the microcosm of world politics that is International Geneva, to understand how culture can be effectively deployed in the service of diplomacy. And in reflecting on all this, as was mentioned in the introduction, it occurs to me I may be one of the few people in this room who has actually been deployed as a tool of cultural diplomacy. As a dancer with the Royal Ballet, I performed in many, many tours abroad, some of which I now realize were at particularly strategic moments in time, China in 1983. Russia in 1987, and in 2008, I danced in Beijing again as part of the handover ceremony of the Olympic Games. Perhaps the artist in me should be happy just to believe there's a magical power in cultural diplomacy, having been out there on the front line for so many years. But the analyst in me is not happy to leave it there. I want a full and proper understanding of what culture can do for us as individuals, as communities, and as nations. And if we're ever going to have that understanding, research is going to be critical. If culture really can influence the way people think, feel, and behave, if we can prove what so many of us instinctively believe to be true, I'd like to know about it. It would open up all sorts of possibilities for how we consider culture and, in theory, from which pots of money we ought to fund it. But let me leave you with what I think is the most important question. If culture really can help to make the world a safer and more harmonious place, wouldn't it be worth whatever it costs to find that out? Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all a very useful and fruitful conversation over the next few days. And I think it speaks to the previous panel, that, that question of, of, of freedom of expression. Um, I think artists have found brilliant ways to squidge outside the pressure of, of political um, manipulation. If you look at Soviet Russia and, and how many great works of art emerged out of that, either in a... In a an underhand way or simply by a sort of samizdat uh, version of, 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 of publishing. I think in the UK, and I would say this, the arms length system, which recognizes that for government funding come obligations, I mean, I think that, that's fair enough, but the arms length system, which means that it's, it's filtered, as I'm sure you know, through a body which is expert in art, um, has worked very well and I think is worth, um, worth protecting. Um, it was interesting speaking to for instance, the, the Russian ambassador in, in, in Geneva, who was really clear on, on, on the role of culture and, 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 and actually um, not in a way that I found disturbing at all. He, he saw it as a way to, to assert the country's um, values, but also its uh, sophistication. He talked about you know, Russia as being a combination of East and West and that actually in its culture they're trying to... He used the phrase, we want people to know there aren't bears in the street, which I, which I, which I, I liked very much and wrote down. Um, I think it will, that there is a danger that when governments, um, if we do prove, if, if not in my lifetime, that culture has this power to influence and it, behaviors, then one would expect there is a danger that, that governments could use that to, 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 to bad ends. But I would say that it's, you know, the, the people get the government they vote for, at least in a democracy, um, and that's a better reason than ever to, to assert one's, one's right for a democratic voice. <laughs>